I'm in. Let's get how much shorter I am than you as well. Well, it is an absolute privilege to be here. Uh, morning. As Tom said, my name's Martin. Uh, I am from Canterbury in England. Uh, I flew over, landed on Wednesday, uh, and I fly home Tuesday evening. So it's quite a kind of, Tom keeps on saying to me, it's basically like a long weekend that you're here for. I'm it's a bit longer than that, but that's, uh, that's what it feels like. But it's so great to be here. I can remember four years ago, um, I went to New Zealand with Tom to go minister to the churches out there. And on the way back, we stopped off in San Francisco because Tom was beginning to feel the call of God around, is, is the Lord calling him and the sure family to move to San Francisco to plant a church? And we were walking along the beach, praying together, uh, seeking God on it. So it's just such a joy uh, to be here. It's been great to kind of stay with the Shores and see them as a family uh, and just really flourishing in the city and then to be here today. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to be speaking this morning from Matthew chapter 14. So if you've got your Bibles, um, open them uh, to that. Uh, section of scripture. It's a very famous part of scripture. If, if you've kind of grown up in church or you've been around church, you've probably heard the story of Jesus walking on water. That's where we're going to be today. Um, but I just hope that actually what I draw from this, the Lord would encourage you, uh, would strengthen you uh, and would bless you this morning. Uh, I'm married. I've got a wife called Catherine and I've got two girls. Annabeth is eight uh, and Millie is six um, and they send their love. They're very jealous that I'm here uh, without them. Um, but they have to be at school and someone has to look after them. So that's why. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read uh, through this. So we're going to be beginning in, in verse 22 of Matthew chapter 14. Uh, I'm going to read a few verses, stop, pull out a few things, read a few more verses, stop, and we'll journey through to verse 33. Uh, so let's read it together. It says this. Immediately he, that's Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Now, often when we read the Bible, because we have our chapters and we have our verses, we can be quite guilty at times at just reading that section and not paying any uh, notice to the context of what's going on. So let me just give you a little bit of backdrop to what's happened before this. Just before this has been the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000, which again, if you've grown up near church, you'll know this story, that a big crowd have come, which often Jesus was very good at drawing crowds. They'd come and they'd listened all day to his teaching in quite a kind of uh, desolate place. There wasn't really anyone around uh, or anywhere to go. There weren't shops around the corner. And so people were beginning to get hungry. And so the disciples have said to Jesus, we probably should send them away uh, so that they can find some food. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. And the disciples say, what are you talking about? There's no way we can feed uh, this crowd. We're, we're overwhelmed. You know, Jesus, uh, they, they seek out, they find this, this boy with, you know, two loaves or sorry, two fish and five loaves, whatever it is. Uh, and um, and they, Jesus multiplies them. He blesses it and they feed the 5,000. This part of this passage now is just after that. And it says, it's this really interesting beginning where it says immediately... Jesus dismisses the crowd and he puts the disciples in the boat. Now, Mark, in the kind of account in Mark, in Mark 6, you read that before Jesus feeds the 5,000, it refers to the season that Jesus had found himself in as incredibly busy. So it says that they were so busy, the comings and goings were so much, that it said they they had no leisure even to eat. That's how busy they were. Now, from what I hear, San Francisco sounds like a very busy city. Sounds like you have busy lives, that work is something that, you know, is a busy ingredient to how you operate. I defy anyone to be at the point where you've been, I mean, particularly, I would never feel like this, that you're so busy that you can't even eat. I'll have meetings, but I'll eat in those meetings. You know, there's no way that food wouldn't be a priority for me in the way that I operate. But yet Jesus and the disciples had been in a season where the pressure of ministry, the pressure of work had been so much that they had no leisure even to eat. And it's interesting that Jesus, in Mark 6, you read this, it says, he says to the disciples, it's been so busy, let's go to a desolate place, let's go and rest. And so they get in a boat and they travel across. But the crowd see Jesus going and somehow they run round before Jesus arrives and he steps off of the boat to a crowd that are seeking his kind of, his ministry, his help, his teachings and his works. It says, Jesus, moved by compassion, ministered to the crowd. He taught them. So he'd been really busy. He'd said to his disciples, let's get away to a desolate place. Let's go and rest. They get there and there's a crowd already there. And that's the context of the feeding of the 5,000. And so as soon as that's happened, though, here it says immediately he dismisses the crowd and he puts the disciples on the boat. The first thing I just wanted to highlight, I felt the Lord really strike me with, is Jesus' ruthlessness when it comes to rest. That he had gone to that desolate place to find rest. 
There'd been a crowd there, and so out of compassion, he'd ministered to them. But as soon as he'd ministered to them, he still prioritised rest. And I think we can sometimes be guilty of our approach to rest. It's almost like it's an additional, it's a luxury. If I manage to get everything done that I need to do in my week, then I will rest. And you see that Jesus, there are times when Jesus modelled working very hard. Uh, He was busier than any of us, uh, and so Jesus modelled that. But he also modelled this centrality of ensuring that the rhythm of a believer is that actually we are a people of rest. If the Saviour needed to rest, how much more do we need to? If God, who had come from heaven and incarnated, became flesh, needed to rest, who are we to say that we don't need rest? And so Jesus here models for us this ruthless nature. He dismisses the crowd, he puts the disciples on the boat, and he rests. How are we doing on that? As we look at this last week, have we made excuses for ourselves that actually we've not allowed ourselves physically and emotionally and spiritually to stop? You know, when the Lord created all things, it really struck me, and just in my own journey with the Lord, when you read through the creation story in Genesis, it talks about that God made all things in six days, and on the sixth day he made man, and on the seventh day they rested. Humanity's first day on earth, according to scripture, was a day of rest, their first full day. They didn't rest because they'd achieved anything. The Lord had done it all. He made them and then they rested. Rest is an important ingredient for us and Jesus models it here. But what he also models is what rest isn't. It doesn't say, dismisses the crowd, puts the disciples in the boat, and then he has a nap. Now, I'm the, I love a nap. Uh, you know, I know Tom, Tom loves a nap every day we've been here. He's, uh, he's snuck off for a little cheeky nap at some point. There is this ingredient of where for us we can sometimes think rest is we'll watch our favourite TV show. Rest is, uh, you know, we'll have a little sleep. It says here, Jesus went up the mountain to pray. I think there's two ingredients you see modelled here. The first is that to rest, you do need to switch off from the pressures and the responsibilities that you carry. That there is a sense of where you can switch off, but you must switch on to the things of God. That's why the Lord gave us the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a gift from God to be able to engage with him to a greater degree to remove away the distractions and the pressures that come from normal life and have this regular moment, once a week or whatever it looks like for you, where you're able to stop and enjoy the things of God. That's what Jesus models to us. So rest is really important. Jesus shows us that. And then it goes on, it says this, when evening came, he was there alone, verse 24. But the boat by this time, so this is where the disciples are, the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, which is between three to six o'clock in the morning, uh, in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. So the context here is Jesus needs rest. So he's dismissed the crowd and he's put the disciples in the boat. They've gone away on the boat and Jesus has gone to rest. And whilst Jesus is up the mountain praying, the disciples have been traveling across the lake and basically have entered a storm. And this storm has got worse and worse and worse. And by this point, they are far, they're far away from land. So they've been traveling for quite a significant period of time. And they are hitting a serious storm. Now, most of the disciples actually were fishermen. So they would have been used to being on water. I am not very used to being on water. A few years ago, my family and I, we went on holiday down to uh, kind of Cornwall, which is the kind of southwest of England. Uh, and one day we went on a, on a boat trip. It was called a seafari. Uh, and so they'd said to us, you can go on this thing. And there's like, a, you know, England has, has, doesn't have the most exciting of animals, uh, really. And so this was like, the appeal was, you might see seals. There was like an 80% chance of seeing seals and a 50% chance of seeing dolphins. We're like, we're in. This is going to be amazing. And so we go on this boat and, uh, and we're leaving the harbour and it's like a beautiful, calm sea. It's raining a little bit, but kind of in this boat you can't really feel it. And we're travelling along and we're looking out the window and I'm just there with my children. Like, what a picturesque, beautiful moment this is. And then I noticed in the distance this boat was absolutely rocking, like really rocking in the waves. And I'm thinking, why is that boat rocking and ours is really calm? And then it, suddenly we kind of, basically the land had been like a, a windshield for us. And as soon as we got past the land, these waves started hitting. We're terrified. My, my oldest daughter literally didn't stand up. She didn't even, we saw dolphins, she didn't even see them. She was so scared. She just sat there like this. My youngest daughter, who's six, just was like fearless, wanting to wander. I was terrified it's going to fly over the side. We're like desperately clinging on, like hoping to get back to land at some point. The thing that gave us confidence was that the guy driving the boat never looked worried. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you're not used to something, you look to the person that is, and if they look calm, you feel really, it's okay. I might be scared, but they know what they're doing and they're not scared. The disciples were terrified on this, on this boat. They were used to storms. 
They were used to waves. They were used to wind. And yet at this point, this is a serious storm that they find themselves in. And what has really struck me as I've been kind of just meditating on this passage is it was obedience that led them into the storm. They simply did what Jesus told them to do. Jesus said, get into the boat, and they did. And they found themselves in a terrifying storm. Now, storms, obviously, here in this story, this is a literal storm. This is wind and waves. But biblically, there's often poetry is used, poetical language, that storms often represent challenges and hardships and difficulties that we can face in our lives. And I don't know about you, but so often when I go through storms in life, my default position is to assume I've done something wrong and that God is punishing me. The Jonah story. Jonah is called by God uh, to go to Nineveh uh, and to tell them that they need to repent. And rather than going to Nineveh, he jumps on a boat and he goes in the total opposite direction to Tarshish. And while he's on that boat, it says the Lord sends a storm basically to get Jonah's attention because of his disobedience. That's not what is going on in this story. In this story, their obedience has led them into a storm. And I wonder if for some of us today, we're in seasons of life where we're facing hardship and challenge and difficulty. And we're looking and we're thinking, I don't feel like I've been disobedient to God. In fact, I feel like I have followed what I felt God called me to, and yet I've entered into these challenges. That can happen. You know, the last couple of years for us as a family have been the most difficult two years we've ever faced. Uh, In May 2019, my father passed away. uh, And then in November 2019, my wife Catherine, she was 32 at the time, was diagnosed with breast cancer. uh, And so had to go through two operations and they removed the lump. Uh, and it had spread into a lymph node, so she had to have a second operation to remove the lymph nodes. And then, praise God, she didn't have to have chemotherapy, but she had to have radiotherapy. And that was a really difficult season for us. I mean, if anyone here has ever experienced a loved one being diagnosed with cancer, you hear that word and you can't help but assume the worst and jump to a place that it takes you to. And so that was a really difficult season for us. Uh, Just as she began radiotherapy, COVID hit. And so the whole nation goes into, the whole world goes into lockdown and my wife's having to go to hospital where all the sick people are and coach, do you know what I mean? It's just, it was unreal. We're trying to homeschool our children uh, whilst all of this is going on. I think we gave up on that after about two minutes. Uh, just forget it, you know, you'll catch up when you go back to school. Uh, the challenges that came. Then uh, uh, my wife was kind of, uh, she's doing really well now, uh, kind of by the April. It was her birthday, her 33rd birthday was her last day of radiotherapy. She dung the bell and she came home to us and we were able to celebrate because we couldn't go to the hospital with her uh, to be with her during it. She's then kind of, the idea was that for her, from the April through to the kind of end of summer was a chance for her to recover, emotionally process. The kids are home that entire time. Uh, Church, we're trying to reinvent everything of church. So as Tom said, I lead the eldership team at the church in Canterbury. So we're trying to work out how do we do Sundays online? How do we do small groups? How do we do pastoral care? How do we do mission? All of those things, everything being thrown up in the air. Uh, And then in the summer, I started to get kind of stomach pains and they just got worse and worse and it turned out I had something called intersusception of the bowel which is where a polyp had grown on my bowel it killed that part and it was kind of swallowing itself which is life-threatening didn't realize that until quite late on ended up having to have emergency surgery uh, in the kind of September uh, of 2020 and so then was recovering from that and then to top it all off at the start of January 21 we decided to have just a small bit of building work done on our house Uh, It was meant to be a six-week thing, tiny extension, new kitchen. Uh, That took about a year. Uh, The builder was a fraudster, robbed us of quite a lot of money. So we have been through like some pretty intense challenges. And throughout it all, we've been asking ourselves regularly that question of why. What did we do wrong? Was it, was, were we doing things that caused, and I just really felt God said, sometimes we live in a fallen, broken world. That means that challenges and difficulties are going to come our way. We will face storms and they're not because of God's punishment of you. We don't believe that, do we? As Christians, we don't believe that God would punish us in that way. Why? Because Christ took the punishment on the cross for us. So we no longer live under the anger or the wrath of God. We live under the pleasure and the delight of a father. And so actually, often, when we go through storms, we must fight to not believe lies that come our way. The disciples simply did what Jesus said, and they went into the storm. I have no idea why. I'd love it if we didn't have to face storms. And actually, in our Western world, we're often believing a lie that Jesus promises us an easy life. That to follow Jesus means comfort, it means security, and it means ease. You don't find that in the scriptures. To follow Jesus means that you will face difficulties, but take heart. Why? Because he has overcome the world. As that's what I love here. In this place of serious storm, 
between three and six in the morning, which is such an un- ungodly hour, isn't it? If you've got kids, it's like, if they wake up before six, I just refuse to move. I'm like, I am, this is too early. After six, I can handle anything before. Probably you guys are up at like four working or whatever, but in Canterbury, it's a bit slower. Uh, and yet in this place, far away from land, in the middle of a storm, in ridiculous hour, Jesus meets them. Friends, the hope we have is in a God that comes and meets us in the storms. Our comfort and our hope is this, that Jesus said, no longer will you be left as orphans, but I will send my spirit to be with you. That you will know God in the midst of hardship and problems and difficulty and fear and pain. We have a God that comes and meets us in that place. And I love it. The Bible's full of understatements. My favourite understatement in the scripture is after Jesus has been in the wilderness for 40 days fasting. You know, we're in the season of Lent right now. It says, after 40 days of not eating, it says, and Jesus was hungry. I'm like, what an understatement that is. You know, like Martin is ravenous. I would have died, I reckon, if I'd gone 40 days fasting. You know, it just says he was hungry. Or when you read Genesis and it says that, you know, he's creating all the things. It just says, oh, and he made the stars. The, the Bible is full of these understatements. And here it just says, and Jesus met them walking on the water. Just like that's normal. In the middle of a storm, far away from land, Jesus just walks past them. I love to, like, I'd love to have been able to understand the mindset of the disciples. As Jesus puts them on a boat, and they start sailing away, and he goes up the mountain. Whether any of them said, wait a minute, how's Jesus going to get to where we're going after this? Because we're going in the boat, and he's up there. Like, how is this going to work? And then he just walks on the water. Often it's in the storms that we really see God meet with us in miraculous, supernatural ways. Storms, despite the hardship and the challenge they bring, what they do do is they remind you of your weakness and of your need for God. And we live in a world that tries to hide that from us. We live in a world that tries to teach us that we're strong. That we don't need God. We don't need the church. We don't need church community. We can do this on our own. If it's to be, it's up to me, is a saying that's really shaped our culture in the way that we think. If there is a problem, you can climb it. If there is an issue, you can solve it. It's you're the answer to every problem. When storms come and you realise you can't solve that, it throws you to the rock that is higher than you makes you cling to Christ and believe in him. Jesus meets us in those places. And so I want to encourage you, if you're going through difficulty at the moment, if you feel like you're in a season where there is a storm that you're facing, Jesus wants to come and meet you in that place, in unexpected ways and in unexpected places. But it carries on and it says this, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus comes and meets them in the storm, walking on water. And because of the storms that they're facing, really, they've begun to look through everything through the lens of fear. They're terrified. They genuinely are thinking they're going to die in this moment. And then Jesus walks past on the water. There is no idea, there is no hint of them thinking that that's Jesus. They they are not looking for God in the middle of the storm, and yet he comes and meets them there. I think sometimes fear can cause us to do that. When we're going through hardships, we can forget to look for God. When we're really hurting, we don't look for the Lord. We don't think he wants to be drawn to us. That book, Gentle and Lowly, that Tom, uh, you know, that the church is giving away is an incredible book. If you've not read it, just take it anyway, whether you're new here or not. It's amazing. Uh, And in there, it talks about often when we are going through hurt and pain, the heart of Christ is drawn to us. That when we're going through those things, he's drawn to us. Almost this picture here is Jesus up the mountain praying. It's almost like his heart is drawn to the disciples and the fear that they're facing. And so he comes close. But fear can make us miss God. They're more willing to believe it's a ghost than it's Christ. Aren't we wired like that sometimes? We're so willing to look to anything and everything else before we look to the Lord. In your storms and in your challenges, look to Jesus. And I love his words because he turns out, he's walking on water. They're crying that it's a ghost. Now, if I was Jesus, I'd probably be saying something like, no, you idiots, I'm not a ghost, I am the Lord. You know, I am able to do all things. You've seen me do so many miracles. Do you really not think I could walk on water? And yet he doesn't. He says these words, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. We can be those that are fearless because the Saviour is close to us. Our strength doesn't come from within. You know, like, again, our culture teaches us, you've got to search for the hero inside yourself, as the M people would say. I don't know, are they known in England, uh, in America? Is that an English band? Uh, I won't sing it, don't worry. But But it's this idea of, like, just look deep within and you'll find the ability to face whatever's going on. Here, Jesus isn't saying that. Why are they able to take heart and not be afraid? It's because Jesus is there. 
And then I love it. I love Peter. He's one of my favourite characters in the Bible. It says, and Peter answered him. Often he's quite eager. If you don't know of the disciples, Peter's the one that just is the blunderbuss of the crew. Uh, in the Gospels, he's like my hero because he's just stupid. Uh, and he says things he shouldn't say. Jesus calls him, say, get behind me, Satan, at one point. At another point, you know, he's like, I'd never deny you. And then he's terrified of a little girl and he refuses to acknowledge Jesus. And, you know, he just gets so many things wrong. And here you see him kind of, everyone else is crying out as a ghost. Jesus speaks and then Peter almost immediately he says Peter answered him saying Lord if it's you command me to come to you on the water and he said come so Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came to Jesus I love that Peter does get quite a bad rap but even in this story it's almost like um, he, you know, everyone's focused on what happens next and we'll get there in a moment but just think about this for a second he walks on water because of his obedience to God it's led him into a storm, but then it's led him to walking on water. And I love this. The lens of faith is very much, Lord, if this is you, call me and I'll come. And I think that's what has been modelled. I think Tom and Josie and the Shaw family modelled that for me amazingly, watching them move from England into the US and then move from the Central Valley into San Francisco to start a church plant. It's been built around this idea of, God, if it's you, call us and we'll come. And I love that Jesus' word, is, it just says one word, it's like, come. Do you know when it's, I can imagine him having a little smile on his face. As Peter's like, oh, dang it, you know, really wasn't expecting this to be the response. So I reckon he was saying it as kind of a rhetorical thing, like, Lord, if it's you, you know, trying to impress everyone. And it is, OK, come. And he's like, oh, no, that isn't what I thought was going to happen in this moment. But he steps out. He steps into the impossible. When our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we'll be willing to leave anything and we'll be willing to step into anything. When our eyes are fixed on ourselves or on our storms, we won't leave the boat. And I wonder if for you, where are your eyes fixed in this season that you're in? Are your eyes fixed on the Lord? Are you seeking to follow him wherever he would call? Or are you so focused on the boat that you're in? The things that you have that are making you feel safe, making you feel secure, making you feel comfortable. Jesus says, if anyone is to follow me, they must deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow me. The call of the gospel is a sacrificial call. It's one of laying down our lives for our saviour and being willing to embrace any cost because he's better and greater than anything. The Apostle Paul says, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing joy of knowing Christ Jesus. And that's the invitation for each of us today. That's what Peter's modeling here. He gets out and he walks on water. He does the miraculous. And then it says this, but when he saw the wind, this is still in the middle of the storm. All of this has been, the storm is still raging in all of this has been going on. I have to imagine this story as as soon as Jesus turns up, the storm stops. That's not what happens here. The storm is rocking and Peter gets out, starts walking towards Jesus. And then it says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, are you of little faith? Why did you doubt? I grew up, I wasn't the, the most well-behaved child uh, when I was younger. And so my relationship with like people in authority, my parents, teachers, whoever it was, was always like kind of, if ever they, then I was often in trouble. And so when I read the words of Christ, I often read them through that lens. Like here, he's telling Peter off. You know, Peter got out of the bay, water warm, then he sank. And Jesus like, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt, you fool? You know, like that. Often that's how I receive, I read a tone in Christ that actually Jesus is really disappointed with Peter in this moment. If he just kept his eyes fixed on Jesus, he wouldn't have sunk. He would have walked all the way. You know, he could have walked around the world on water. Think of what Peter would have done if his faith was big enough. I don't think that's what's going on here. I love the fact that it says as Peter sees what's going on around him and gets somewhat terrified as he realises he's out of the boat and starts to sink, it says immediately Jesus reached out. Friends, when we fail, Jesus immediately wants to draw close to us. The enemy wants to speak lies over you, that when sin is in your life, when you make mistakes, when you fail, that God is disappointed in you and God is distant. That is not the gospel that we believe and that is not the God that we know. The God that we know is one that is so close to us who is so for us, that even in our sin, he draws close. Even in our failures, he draws close. When we're sinking, he immediately reaches out and pulls us up. And almost, I imagine those words are with a gentle, loving tone. Oh, you have a little faith. Why did you doubt? I was right there. I was so close to you. Keep your eyes on me. I think it's an invitation to continue to journey in the things of God. Some of you, perhaps, you've stepped out into the things of God, believing he's really called you, and you feel like you're sinking right now. And you're living with this narrative that God is disappointed with you and that you've failed him and that he's abandoned you. That's not what's going on. He's there. He's immediately reaching out and he's pulling you up. 
And then it says this to end. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Jesus steps into the boat and the storm stops. That's the God that we worship. He is able to still storms. When my wife Catherine was diagnosed with cancer, I was really believing God for miraculous healing. I was believing, you know, I've heard stories, I know people that have had cancer just disappear. You know, lumps literally just disappear or grow malignant. Just incredible miracles of God. I was really seeking God for that. Very early on, Catherine said to me, I really, she sensed God speak to her, saying that her story isn't going to be uh, one of miraculous healing. Her story is going to be, look, you know, she says, God said to her, my glory is going to be in your story. And actually through the treatment and through the endurance and through the pain, you being able to be faithful and stand strong, I'm going to be there with you. That's the God that we have. But we also do have a God that is miraculously able to intervene, that can change things in an instant. He steps into the boat and that storm stopped. There's another story where the disciples are in a boat and a storm comes and they're terrified. It says Jesus is sleeping because he's not scared of storms. And they wake him up. Don't you care? And again, Jesus speaks to them. Oh, you have little faith. How long do I have to be with you? Do you not know me enough to know that I care for you? He stands up and he speaks and the winds are still. We have a God that's able to still storms, but he's sovereign over everything. Sometimes he doesn't immediately. I don't know why there is mystery to God. If we knew everything, we would be God. But we're not. There's mystery to it. But he is able. Don't allow the storms to rob you of your faith in believing who God is and what God's able to do. Some of us, we've been in storms for quite a long period of time. Or we've faced multiple storms. COVID was a storm for all of us. The pain and the hurt and the anguish and the difficulty and the fear and the confusion can rob us of confidence. Friends, don't lose sight that we have a God who's able to steal storms. And it says he steps into the boat. He steps into, he's with them. Jesus is a God of relationship and intimacy. But this story was about Peter stepping out on his own. But isn't it interesting that then they come back into the community with the disciples? It's all of them together in the boat. God never calls us to a me and him relationship. When you read the Bible, you'll never see anywhere really this picture of it's all about you and Jesus. This individual mindset of my walk with God is about just me keeping myself in the love of God. Everything you read is written to a group of believers. It's written to churches. It's written to people. It's, it's, and if it's written to one, it's often then encouraged to be read to others uh, and built upon. Jesus brings Peter back into that place of amongst the disciples. The community of God is really important. Prioritise this. In storms, you must have others alongside you. Jesus wants you to build together, to work together and to grow. And then it just says this. And this is my prayer. Anything storm that we face, any challenges that we walk through, when God steps into it, those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. The revelation that came at the end is that Jesus is God. That Jesus is the Son of God. The one that has come to save us from our sins. To draw us into a relationship with God. And to know the love of God so closely with us. And I sense as though Jesus would want to invite you today. That there's an invitation from the Lord this morning for each of us. That just as for Peter, Lord if it's you, call me in and I'll come. It's the invitation of Jesus to each of us to fix our eyes on Christ, to invite him to call us again into the adventure that he has for us and to follow him into those. You may be here today, you may not be a Christian. For you, that invitation is one of entering into relationship with him, of knowing him as your Lord and Saviour, knowing him as your friend and your guide, knowing him as the one who draws close to you in the heart and in the pain and in the hardship. If you're a believer here today, it would be again to trust in Jesus. I sense across the church, across the globe, I think COVID has had an impact on our faith levels of believing for God. If, you know, there weren't many words coming before COVID, prophetic words coming, that brace yourself, there's a pandemic coming that means that you're not going to be able to see people and you've got to do church online. I didn't hear those prophetic words. I would have been well prepared uh, if those had come. And it's rocked us, it's confused us, it's brought challenge. And I feel like, again, God today just wants to invite you, trust him, to step out again, to follow him, together as sanctuary, as a church, moving into the things that God has for you. Step out together following him. So could I invite us to stand? I'd love to pray. And then I have no idea what time is or what you want to do. But um, have we got time for a song? Absolutely. Great. Well, great. Why don't you just where you are, just steal your hearts.